Hello, church. Welcome to everybody here in the house. I'm so glad to be worshiping with you and jumping into God's word with you. And those online, I am so glad you're with us right now, too. This is going to be a good day, and I come in expectant. God wants to do something. Uh, I want to start here, though. We need to do something. Does anybody know what yesterday was? Yeah, it was Veterans Day, right? I have friends who have served and have uh, retired and moved on to other careers, but have done time in the military. They have both served and done humanitarian work. They've also put themselves in harm's way. Many of them have also had to navigate the complexities of war and the horrific spaces. And I feel like today is just a time that we should encourage and cheer for and honor the veterans amongst us. If you have served at all, for your country. Would you please stand? We would love to thank you today, our veterans. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me pray for them as well as our current active duty. Lord, thank you so much for those that are willing to lay down their lives. Thanks for those that sacrifice uh, things that we can't even imagine. Got to pray for uh, these veterans, uh, not only in this room, but those that are our family members that aren't here or our friends that aren't here or those around the world. God, would you watch out for them as they begin to look into the new spaces or the spaces they've already been to live out the calling that you've called them to in this other phase of life. But God, we also pray for our active military and uh, the world is not right. Uh, there is brokenness and there is evil. And we pray, God, that you would work in ways. God, be, be with our leaders. Give them wisdom. Thank you for our veterans and thank you for those that actively serve. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Well, yeah, that's a good day right there. Some amazing stuff we've been in the last eight weeks in Philippians. Pastor Aaron's been preaching a ton on what it means to follow God, and Philippians has been the perfect thing for us to study. Uh, does anybody remember what type of document Philippians is? Um, is it a book report? Uh, is it a, a lawsuit? Uh, what, what, what format is Philippians? Thank you. Yes, it's a letter. It is a traditional letter. I will name it this way. It is a Greco-Roman letter, and in it, you have all kinds of things that highlight both culture and literature, as well as the Apostle Paul uses it for faith. But this is where I wanted to start today. We are not just reading some random letter. We are reading the Word of God today. The Holy Spirit guided the Apostle Paul, and the words that we have today are things that we can look at, and the Holy Spirit can now help us to hear this word and then apply it to our lives and see what we could do. I, I, I like to think about random things sometimes, and this is what I was thinking about this week. Do you think the Apostle Paul, when he finally finished it up and folded it or put some little wax seal and handed it to Epaphroditus to carry all the way back to Philippi, went, Oh boy, in 2,000 years, somebody might be reading this and studying this. Wait, wait, come back here. I want to change a couple lines. Could you imagine living so confidently in what God was doing in and through you that you could trust that if it disappeared and it was never seen again, that was fine. It was what, what it was for. But also being excited enough that if God were to use it for something more, you could trust God more than your own skill set. That's what we got here. We got this crazy letter that we're studying. And, and I want to say this. I think words shape things in powerful ways. The way we communicate shapes things in powerful ways. I put it this way. Once again, we're seeing how God, through Jesus, through the apostle Paul, shapes things. The power of words and I'd even say it this way, better yet, God-infused words and the power of communication, actually, better yet, godly communication can change everything. Are we on the same page? Do you realize that your words can change everything? Do you realize that? Time for a quick survey. If you're brave enough and you're willing to raise your hand, I would deeply appreciate it. Since you came on this campus, those online, since you logged on to this gathering, how many of us have sent at least one text message since we've been here? That's a pretty big crowd. All right, another one. 
How many of us have sent a text message during this gathering? I did. I had to let somebody know something really quick at the very, very beginning part. I did. Yeah, we, we use this form of communication, don't we? It happens a lot. How many of you with your eyes closed could actually text message and get it right? Or better yet, how many of you could text message with your toes, right? Now, I have a really big fat thumb, and so every time I, I'm, I'm a one thud texture and it takes me forever, right? I'm a dad. My texts are really long. They're hard to understand, right? My kids got to get an interpreter. But, but texting is something that we do a lot to shape things. And so I wanted to do a little research because we have the Apostle Paul and the Greco-Roman letter, and we have text messaging. Does anybody know how long ago the first text message was sent? Three decades ago, 30 years it was sent on December 3rd, 1992. And does anybody know what the first text message said? Help? Is that what I, I thought I heard somebody say help. No, that's what I'm still texting today, help. Uh, no, they texted Merry Christmas. A programmer, I'm stopped, I thought it like it's all sentimental. It's all, it's like we're falling in love with text messaging all over again. Uh, it was Merry Christmas because a programmer didn't even know if it was going to work. And so they sent that out. But, but I read an article this week because we're looking at this Greco-Roman letter, traditional way of communicating. I thought I would look a little bit more at text messages. Do you realize this? The world now sends 8.4 trillion text messages a day. The world does. I don't know how they got that number, where that was at. I think it includes the blue bubble and the green bubble crowd together. You know, it's, we're all friends and uh, sending text messages. But listen to this. Guess who sends the most text messages out of any country? The U.S. sends 2 trillion text messages a day. We are almost by far the country that is sending words. And my question for us today might be this, what words are we sending and what difference does it make? Right. Don't worry, I won't beat us up on text messages. I won't tell you you need to send less or more or whatever. I'm more interested in what could this device or maybe even email or maybe even a phone call or whatever form that we communicate are we seeing what God could potentially do like what God did through Paul? Here's kind of an interesting way to think about it. Take all of your text message threads today. So if you're in a back and forth conversation with someone today, what if in 4023, that's kind of shocking, isn't that? 2,000 years from now. What if in 4023, the church of the future based the gospel off what you were text messaging? I just saw a face like this. What if the whole church only had what we said and what we said in there? Wouldn't that be so interesting? That's why this letter to the Philippians is so interesting because it gives us an insight that the Apostle Paul, whether people were looking or not looking or whether he knew it was gonna be used for the church in the future, he had an intentionality about himself where his God-informed life just dripped out of him. He did not write this going, this is gonna be studied around the world in 2023. He wrote this because he wanted his friends and his church and those in Philippi to live faithfully for God. And that's just what naturally came out of him. It's so beautiful because I think in many ways, I probably would have skipped over the passage I'm gonna to preach today. I am preaching the end of Philippians chapter two. And if you're not careful, when you first read it, you're like, well, that's a travel log. Uh, all there is in there is a bunch of details about Paul maybe going back to Philippi. There's some information about Timothy maybe being sent to, to Philippi. And then there's this emphasis that Epaphroditus that we've talked about already in the last eight weeks needs to be sent back to uh, Philippi because he's going to take this letter and he's been sick and he just needs to go home and see everybody because they're worried about him. And it'd be really easy just to go, nothing important to see here, move on and jump to chapter three. But I just kept reading it, reading it and realized if I'm not careful, I'm going to skip over some really significant stuff. So I'm going to take a risk here and I'm going to read 11 verses in a row. Get ready to concentrate. Get ready to really capture what's in here. 
But if you're like me, you might be a little bit, sounds more like updates, and it sounds more like travel planning, and it sounds more like my family. We can never pick a date where we can all get vacation and go anywhere. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. The word of the Lord, not just a letter, says this. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. Verse 25. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also a messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him and not on him alone, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He raised his life, he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give him. The word of the Lord, not a basic Greco-Roman letter. Did any of you get distracted at all? Did any of you find your mind starting to go to other things? 11 verses is a lot sometimes, isn't it? Did any of you, boy, come on, I, I'm much more easy to chew on one verse at a time. That was too much information. I feel overwhelmed. I feel that way sometimes when I read longer passages of scripture and I have to slow myself down to concentrate because so much of what I get now is so fast paced and moving that concentration is almost something that I need a little bit more energy and effort to work on. But, but in here, there is some things that I think can radically have an impact on your life and my life, and, and we're wanting to really take it seriously. And so I won't say that this was nothing good to be seen here, move on and hurry up and jump to chapter three. We are going to dig into this last portion of chapter two, and when we get to the end of it, I think like my own life, you will go, that's exactly what I needed. If texting is a tool and a device... Can I give you one more philosophical, thoughtful way to think about life before we jump into this passage? Would that be okay with you? I get blamed sometimes for bringing illustrations. Can I tell you this? I bring illustrations because it's the only way I can remember things and I have to see something practical. I want you to imagine this big old duffel bag as some examples of how some of us do faith. Would that be okay? Here's the deal. I was just reading to you a longer passage of scripture and I was hinting at the effort and the energy that it would take to actually study it and get ready. Some of us, I think, including myself, do faith like a Sunday picnic at the park and we like simple and easy when it comes to packing and preparing. Picnic at the park, all I need is a blanket, and if I have some snacks, I'm golden, and so I have my car and bar. Wow, that was really easy. I'm going to go enjoy a day at the park. I love faith. It's really easy, isn't it? I'm going to be using a preparing kind of metaphor here. Some of us think that the highs are quick, and just a little bit of effort will get us long ways, and we only pack for an afternoon in our faith rather than looking the long haul in the distance. Uh, I got something else in here. It's, it's kind of interesting because some of you like trips. And so I actually packed a carry-on. And in this carry-on, some of you could do a day or two days. You know, you can get everything you need in there. You just wear the same sweatpants for the whole two days and you're all good. But in here, I put a couple really important things like, let me see. Oh, yeah. 
got to have your medications. If you're going to be gone two days, you got to keep up your high blood pressure. And then, oh man, I know this. You're going to go get some serious barbecue. So you got to have your Tums, right? If you go out of town. But for some of us, faith is a little bit more like, ah, I'm, I'm kind of serious about it. I'm, I'm going to do a little bit more effort. I'll, I'll read occasionally, maybe once a week or something like that. Or I'll try to listen to a podcast every once in a while. I'll try to go a little bit. But, but I got another one. I, some of us like longer term trips and we want to go for a whole week. And we actually have to think through, what will I take? Will I have time to sit on a beach? Could I read a little bit? Oh, look, a book on Philippians. I could dig a little bit deeper in what I'm doing. And if we plan for a week trip, you got to think through five outfits. I need to make sure enough uh, toothpaste is in the toothpaste dispenser to get through all five days. And you actually have to develop some energy and effort to get through to being ready for a trip like that. But I got to tell you, as I think about faith and what I've been reading in Philippians and what I'm honestly trying to do myself is when the Apostle Paul talks when the Apostle Paul is working with the people in Philippi, when the Apostle Paul is getting ready for all the things that are happening and going on, do you know that I hear the Apostle Paul planning and being ready for eternity? Have you ever planned for a couple month long trip before? I know students that would go away on study abroad. I know people that would go move somewhere for a job and think through, I can't move my entire house, but I can move enough that I am fully vested, all bought in and ready to go for a lifetime. And what I'm hoping today is I talk about the end of this Philippians chapter two, you will be asking yourself the question, as I do this faith, not only am I thinking about my words and what I'm saying and what's shaping me, but I also want to think through, am I bought in and preparing for eternity? The long term. Are my decisions creating a preparedness for me that this isn't just a, a casual in the moment high, but this is the long term of what it means to follow God. I had a great conversation with somebody that was here today visiting because they're actually moving and they were sad, and I was a little sad, and they were saying goodbye, and I'm like, wait a second, don't say goodbye, we got all of eternity in front of us. Wait a second, we've done life and relationship that if I don't see you again, when I see you in heaven, I won't be like, oh no, there he is, we didn't do well together, and now I'm stuck with him forever. That the preparation and the life we've done together is preparing us for eternity. We are disciples, we are pilgrims, everything we base our life on should be God-informed, should be God-shaped. And that's why I'm actually really excited about this passage today and want to point some things out to you. But let me read this quote from Eugene Peterson first that was really shaping some of my thinking on this before we study the scriptures. Eugene Peterson says this about thinking in really like critical ways. He says, we are impatient for results. This is what I would say. We really like the afternoon picnic called Christianity, but we're not necessarily always ready for the long-term effort and commitment. He says this, we only want the high points. The Christian life cannot mature in such ways. It is a long obedience in the same direction, which the mood of the world does so much to discourage. There are two biblical designations of people of faith that are extremely useful, disciple and pilgrim. Disciple says we spend our lives apprenticed to our master, Jesus Christ, and pilgrim tells us we are people who spend our lives going to God through Jesus Christ for the way, the truth, and the life from the book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. What we're going to study today at that last part of chapter two in Philippians is going to get us ready for a long obedience in the same direction. And I tried to like really work on some themes that I saw in those 11 verses. And I want to highlight those for us and then ask us the question, is that taking root in us now? The first one that I saw throughout all of that 11 verses was this concept of to think deeply. The Apostle Paul, 
is not in a casual letter writing moment. He is in a God infusing God at every sentence, God at every turn moment, and it changes everything. One of the things I've learned in doing life with people is that sometimes it's hard to talk about God, isn't it? You don't feel confident about it sometimes, or you're not sure where to insert God or where to insert yourself. Do you realize the Apostle Paul makes sure to introduce and insert God all the time? It's almost like God is on the tip of his tongue all the time. He can't help have a conversation without God coming out of his mouth. Or if he were here today, he couldn't help himself if God ended up in a text message. The Apostle Paul was so focused on thinking deeply that really the way he was thinking was theologically. You know what theology is? Theology is the understanding, the study, the interest in God. And what's even even better than theology is practical theology. How is who God is and what God's doing in my life can be lived out in this? And sometimes it will only happen as we begin to think deeply and ask God to help us know how to navigate the world. Can I give you some examples of some of the verses in here that point out Paul being theological or practically theological? Listen to Philippians 2, verse 19. It says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 19, the first part of it, verse A. You know what I love? Is I can be really honest with you right now and say, the first time I read this part of the scriptures to preach today, I was like, oh no, good luck, Woody. I'm not sure there's much here. And then the more I dug into it, I realized there was a work that God wanted to do in my heart. Let me take out four really critical words that were in that verse. And let me show you what it would look like if this was a normal everyday letter or a personalized text message and God was completely rooted out of it. What if the Apostle Paul would have said this? I hope to send Timothy to you soon. And the reference instead of Philippians would be, I got this. Chapter 2, verse 19. Do you see what a difference those four words make in there? It makes all the difference in the world. How many of us love to be confident and pushy with what we're thinking we should do and completely leave God out of stuff? All right, I'm, I'm curious here. How many of you have applied for a job anytime recently, whether it's a, a giant full-time job that's going to change your family's dynamics or your very first job as an 18-year-old as you're ready to work for Chick-fil-A? How many of you in the last five years have done an application? Yep. They're scary, aren't they? Doesn't it mess with your identity a little bit because you're trying to pump yourself up going, yeah, I'm the best person for this job. I don't care that 10,000 other people applied for it. I got this, right? Do you realize how much of a difference four added words would be in our journey in things like applying for a job? You and I could choose the book, the self-proclaimed book called I Got This, chapter 2, verse 19, and simply try to pump ourselves and go, I'm the smartest, I'm the most educated, I'm going to be the best for that company, they need me, I got this. But how different would the application be if it was like this? I hope in the Lord Jesus that if this job is right for me, I will get it. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said about the situation with Timothy. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. Do you like that he has an idea? That he's focused and wanting to move the gospel forward? He feels like Timothy, this one that studied with him, would be the best person to send. But it's couched with the understanding that he hopes that Jesus would make it clear, would open the doors, would make it happen. Church, Are we living in such a way that we're thinking deeply about everything, including applications? Here's another example in this sweet set of 11 verses that's been challenging me. Verse 24 says, and I trust. And another way that one of the versions says is, I am confident in the Lord that I will also come soon. Now the apostle Paul is hoping that he will come. That's verse 24. He is in prison. He is in a spot where he misses the church in Philippi, the people he's poured into, and he wants them to grow in Jesus. And he's trying to think through, what's my next move? Any chance I could talk this jailer into like traveling with me and taking a two-week break from prison so I can get back to Philippi? 
Like he has so many unknowns. He doesn't know if he's going to go to trial. He doesn't know when he would go to trial. Don't know if he'll be executed. Doesn't know if he'll be freed. But he was so clear in his language that if I had to come up with another fake reference or another fake Greco-Roman letter, what if it were to say this? And I will also come soon. And the reference I came up with is, I'm in charge, chapter 2, verse 24. The apostle Paul could have gotten really feisty and said, I'm determined. I'm going to talk this Roman court into letting me go. I'm going to make sure that this jailer knows who's in charge. I'm going to claim my rights. I'm going to get the highest paid attorney. And I'm going to get out of here. But this letter doesn't say that. Listen to the way it was really written again. Philippians 2.24 said, and I trust in the Lord that I will also come soon. How many of us in here need I trust in the Lord for whatever circumstance we're going in right now? How many of us need to be telling that to somebody else we're doing life with? Hey, I'm praying for you that you will trust in the Lord that he would make clear what you're supposed to do. But our temptation sometimes is like, you got this. Be confident. Rise up. Be strong. They need you. You know what a different way of approaching life is when we think deeply? I trust the Lord that if I'm supposed to do this, this will open up and I will move forward. That changes everything. That is planning for eternity. That's not just some picnic in the park in the afternoon for a quick little spiritual moment and forget God all week long. That is planning and going deep with God throughout your whole life and getting ready for eternity. One more example here, and this is when the Apostle Paul was writing about Epaphrodites uh, coming back to Philippi. And he says this in verse 27, he was indeed so ill that he almost died. He nearly died, but God had mercy on him. Here's my other fake version, everybody. It's called Fighter, chapter 2, verse 27. He was indeed so ill that he nearly died, but he pushed through. I hope with these three uh, examples in the scripture here, you're realizing that thinking deeply makes a difference. I don't want a church full of fighters that go, oh man, I planned it all out. I knew which antibiotic I needed to get. I drove to Mexico and I got this big old bottle of antibiotics and man, I'm a fighter. I took care of myself. But by the way, medicines and doctors can make a huge difference. But at the end of the day, guess what? I want to live a life that's more based on but God. Amen. But God worked and used those doctors in that medicine. I don't want to just say the fighter in me is all just for what I can pull off on my own. Listen to what the scriptures actually said again, and I bolded and underlined it so that we'd make sure that we heard it really clear. Epaphroditus, he was indeed so ill that he nearly died, but God had mercy on him. Church, are we thinking deeply enough are we communicating deeply enough? Are, are we sending text messages that have hope in it? Uh, are, are, are the ways that we're looking at scenarios proving that we are thinking deeply that God wants to be involved in everything and wants us to pack and prepare and plan for the ha long haul of all eternity? We are becoming something. We're disciples and we're pilgrims. All right, let me give you a second theme because I really believe there's another theme in these 11 verses and, and was kind of trying to dig deeper to really see what would shape us or change us because they're all pulling us to something more. And what they're pulling us to is this. I think there's another theme in here about love fully. Did you hear how many emotional moments the Apostle Paul was writing in this letter? Like he talked about being really sorrowful. He talked about really wanting to wrestle through the fact that his good friend Epaphroditus almost died. I mean, this guy was so concerned that he was raw and real and allowed his emotions to be there. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. It says, I have no one else so like myself who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. All of them are seeking their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. In this particular part, it's the second half of those uh, 11 verses, and the Apostle Paul's talking about Epaphroditus, and he's going back to Philippi. If you flip your Bibles all the way to chapter 4, there are two other Philippians that are living in ways that are destructive. They're against each other. They're talking badly. There's gossip. They're creating division. And the Apostle Paul is actually highlighting both Timothy 
and Epaphroditus as, look at these models. One, they're thinking deeply, and two, they're loving in the most full way possible. And what did it tell us that Epaphroditus was doing? He was putting other people's interests before his own. Like he so deeply loved people that all he could do was think about them rather than himself. And the Apostle Paul was so impressed by this. He basically said, there's very few people like this, but this guy knows you, cares about you, and wants to make all the difference in the world. How many of us struggle with what it looks like to love fully? Could I confess some of mine? It happened to me even today. I was walking to this back corner and I said hi to somebody and they said hi to me. And then I took another step and they said something. They said, I love you. And for a brief moment there, I felt like I was 16 years old when I first dated my wife and I'd been building up for eight months because I'm one of those deep thinkers. I don't want to say something that I'm not sure about or I don't know. And I'm kind of there. And then all of a sudden inside of me, I, I remember the first time I said it to my wife, and I was like, mm, I love you. <laughs> Do you realize the Apostle Paul, when it came to Christian family and loving fully, probably spoke what he was living into before he was ever even ready to fully do it. And it didn't mean perfection because the Philippians are the ones that were struggling and pushing back and had all these different things going on in them. And the apostle Paul was living in a bold, loving, living lifestyle that changed everything. Can I tell you how this church impressed me so much and overwhelmed me? In 2019, when I started working here in November, it was only four months and then the pandemic came. And in that pandemic, my son was in South Africa studying abroad, and they were trying to figure out how to get him home, you know, where their airlines, they weren't sure how serious this new virus was, and all the things that we were trying to figure out and learn, and he finally got a flight home, but had been exposed everywhere. And I mentioned it to a couple of people that I work with here at Hillside, and said, man, we're not sure what we're going to do. Do we make him sleep in a tent in the backyard? Do we let him inside the house? Do we just, you know, it's no big deal. We'll get sick. He gets sick. And not knowing what to do. And there was a gentleman in this church that caught me after that prayer request moment and all of that and said, hey, I have an RV. I'll clean it up. I'll get it ready. I'll bring it over to your house. You're welcome to use it and have it for as long as you want. And I went, who does that? Family doesn't even do that. Did you realize what the apostle Paul is calling us to? He's calling us not only to think deeply, but to love fully to where we're now starting to do things with one another that doesn't even make sense. We put the interest of others before we put our own interest. I got a text message the other day from a newer believer that's attending Hillside, and we've been going back and forth trying to encourage each other and spur one another on. Imagine that text message being used for discipleship. And we're going back and forth, and all of a sudden, I'm reading this little short text message, and at the bottom, it says, I love you. And I went, God, help me to lean into loving the way other people are loving me because I am being put to shame sometimes for how ready people are to do this and it wasn't anywhere bubbling out of me yet. Wow. I'm feeling so challenged by this Philippians passage. I thought it was just a travel log and some updated information and the apostle Paul is living radically and he's calling me to live radically and you to live radically. Where do we need to live more fully, love more fully? Where, where are we hesitant and like, ah, I don't know, they might hurt me like other places have. Yes, they will, we all do it. But when our identity is so secure this direction, do you know we can live radically this direction? That's what Philippians is calling us to. There's one third kind of theme that I want to point out that is really just inspiring for me on this whole idea of my words, my messaging, and how I live. And it's the theme of live securely. And you might be asking, well, where's that in this passage? How, how does that make sense? What are you talking about? I think this final theme comes out in all the different ways that the Apostle Paul talks about both Timothy and talks about uh, Epaphroditus. Listen real quick to these verses. Philippians chapter 2, verse 22 says this, but you know that Timothy has proved himself 
because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. And then to Epaphroditus in verse 25, it says this, but I think it necessary to send back to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. Have you guys ever had a coach? And here's why I love the word coach, because you could go all the way back to AYSO and playing soccer or some other sport, right? Or you could even think about a life coach or a business coach or an, app an apprenticeship that you're doing to try to grow into a new vocation. Do you ever have those coaches that speak over you and talk about you, what you're not yet, but will become someday because there is something amazing once they believe in you? That's what the Apostle Paul is doing here with both Timothy and Epaphroditus because God has done something in Paul. He now can speak with this language that absolutely transformed their lives. I broke this down in a half screen slide for you to look at for a second. In living securely, here's what I'm talking about living or what it means to live securely. When we know our identity and our future identity and we trust God to help us to grow into it, there is a security that's beyond anything we could ever imagine because we know with God's help, we can become something. Timothy, the apostle Paul said to him, my son, they had no blood that was shared. They weren't from the same lineage. Timothy was both a Greek and a Jew. His dad was a Greek, his mom was a Jew, and the apostle Paul was a Roman citizen and all the different things. They weren't related, but he called out something powerful over him, called him his son. And it was Timothy who was encouraged that he seeks the well-being of others more than for oneself. Then you got Epaphrodites. Listen to this list. My brother, my co-worker, my fellow soldier, a messenger and minister, one who came close to death for the work of Christ. Man, could you imagine if somebody bragged over you like that, how you'd feel like, I want to, I need to, with God's help, I can't wait to live into my best God self. Church, how we email, how we talk to each other, how we text message, how people do that over us should change everything. If you don't have somebody that's speaking that way over you, you need to find the body of Christ. <laughs> if you're not speaking that over somebody, you are missing out on some of the greatest things that it means to prepare for the long haul, to get ready for eternity, not some short afternoon picnic, but what God really wants to do in us. If you can't tell, I'm pretty fired up about this message because I thought it was just going to be a travel log with a couple little updates, and I'm actually discovering that it is so much bigger than that. Our words matter. We shape one another. And this is what I would ask God to really just stir in you right now. Where in your life is God calling you to think deeply? Think about that for a second. I'm going to give you these three themes again. And I want you to really kind of process with the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Where do you need to think more deeply? Remember what I said? What if your thread of text messages were the scriptures that the church of 4023 used? What kind of church would that be? Think more deeply. Church, what does it look like to love more fully? Where do you communicate that? Where do you live that? And what does it mean for us to live securely where we know our identity and that we need God's help to grow into it. Because I don't know about you, God is working on me like the eternal project that he's going to get ready someday to be ready for heaven. And when I get there, I can't wait for God to show the highlight reel of, look how far we've come. You are thinking deeply, you are loving fully, and you are secure in your identity and what's been named over you. You are a son, you are a daughter of God. Let's do life and all eternity together. Church, I want to pray that over us. Do you know an email, a text message, a conversation, a prayer with somebody or somebody doing over that over you could change the trajectory of reality because that's what God uses to make life happen? I am so thankful for Philippians. And even more than that, I'm so thankful how we as a church can live it out. God, I pray for our church right now. We have been studying Philippians for eight weeks. And we want it to keep shaping us. So I pray in the weeks and then in the days to come that we will really think deeply about you in our life. 
you in our surroundings, you in our reality everywhere we go. And God, I also pray for our church. Would we please help us to love fully? Help us to be willing to engage people as family. Help us to be willing and ready to love and even say I love you in ways that we're not used to or comfortable with. And God, if we're not ready to live that out that fully, help us to be ready to live that out fully. And God, I pray for Hillside. Would we be secure? Would we be absolutely secure so that we can live in such a way where our identity is as brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of God? I pray this will be a radical truth lived out in every single one of us. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.